So when we're live. Sounds good. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Teleshadowing. We are live on YouTube. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat box as we go along and they will be addressed. I'm honored to introduce our mentor for today, Dr. Shelby. Dr. Shelby is in a transitional year intern and he'll be starting his dermatology residency in this summer. He graduated summa cum laude from the University of Texas at Dallas with a bachelor's in biology and a minor in business administration. He then graduated um, from the Texas A&M College of Medicine in May 2022 with honors and in the top 10% of his class, which actually gained him an induction into the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society during his medical school career. During med school, he also served on the Texas A&M School of Medicine's Admissions Committee for over three years. <clears throat> in, in addition, he has also published many case reports in dermatology, has given over 40 poster and oral presentations at multiple esteemed conferences. Now it is my honor to request Dr. Shelby to begin today's session. Thank you. Thank you for the warm introduction. Hey, everybody. Uh, very happy to uh, give this talk about dermatology. Um, I know not only just in undergrad, but also in medical school. If some of you have started med school or for you that are about to start med school, dermatology is not very much covered uh, in medical school. It's either a two week block. Sometimes certain schools, it's only like a block, like a two week block that's attached to another like less covered field, such as ophthalmology. So I'm very happy to be here to kind of talk about the field that I'm about to start this summer. Um, let's see, let's get started. So just a little background about me. So undergraduate school, I went to the University of Texas at Dallas. Um, in medical school, I went to Texas A&M College of Medicine. They, do, they just switched their name to School of Medicine. And then right now I'm doing my intern year, which is a transitional year at Baylor Scott and White, All Saints in Fort Worth. And then in June or end of, uh, end of June, beginning of July, I'll start my dermatology residency at Baylor Scott and White Medical Center at Temple, Texas. Okay. So our first case, we have a 55-year-old HIV patient who came into clinic to see his uh, dermatologist because he has crusting around his fingers. A uh, patient is sexually active with multiple partners and lives in a group home. What is the diagnosis? And so basically the gist of this lecture, um, it was kind of geared towards, so I gave this lecture to uh, medical students who were about to take their like dermatology final. Uh, and so... A lot of you may not know, some of you may know something here and there, uh, but it's okay. Feel free to ask questions or type it in in the question box. So you can see the fingers, they're very crusted, uh, almost ashy in appearance because he's also been itching it. So you have chronic itching um, and then HIV patient, which makes him immunosuppressed. So their immune system uh, is a little um, less strong than the rest of the general population. And this is something we called. Nor, uh, well, it used to be called Norwegian uh, scabies, but they changed it to crusted, uh, crusted scabies. And if you take kind of a dermatoscope or any magnifying glass and you look, you'll see a lot of um, what we call burrows, which are tunnels right under the skin. And you could, and if you scrape it and put it under a slide microscope, you can actually see the scabies too. And with the crusted scabies, it's almost like a more severe type of scabies because normal scabies would be like red, itchy. You'll have some crusted uh, excoriation, but with the uh, crusted scabies, it looks kind of like a sandcastle uh, because of how much uh, dust and itching that has been. And so immunosuppressed patients are patients that you would uh, either patients with a history of AIDS, any transplant patient, any patient that's undergoing chemotherapy or people in nursing homes because they tend to be older uh, and those are immunosuppressed patients. All right, second case, we have a 42-year-old patient who comes in complaining of photosensitivity, which uh, basically means their skin is sensitive to the light, and then hypertrichosis also uh, just basically means excess hair. Uh, you don't have to worry about the hypertrichosis. Uh, doctor, the doctor, physician, dermatologist does a workup and finds that there's a defect in an enzyme. So this is more of a genetic thing. What is the diagnosis? And I, many of you may not know but this is something we call porphyria cutanea tarda or just PCT. It's a very, there's like seven or eight different types of porphyria. These are very uncommon. Um, and some of them are even rare. And then it's a defect in uh, UROD or uroporophyrinogen decarboxylase. So this is something you'll learn in med school. 
Uh, and basically what it is, it's photosensitivity, skin fragility, and hypertrichosis. I didn't show a picture of hypertrichosis. And this one is actually associated with hep C. And you'll notice when you start med school or if you're studying certain like pathology classes in undergrad, you're taking the upper level uh, classes. Hepatitis C has a lot of associations with certain uh, genetic, like this one's a genetic disease, or there's some autoimmune diseases too. Um, and so with this one, kind of the classic pictures, they'll show you like the wrist to the palm with um, either kind of bullies, uh, bullies or vesicles. A vesicle is a small thing that you would think and you pop it and there's fluid. A bulla is uh, basically a vesicle that's over one centimeter and it also has fluids inside of it. And so these people, uh, they're affected by this condition. When they get exposed to the sun, they start popping out these bullas and vesicles in their hand. It's super painful for them. And so they always have to kind of wear, um, you know, either mittens or very much so uh, some protective covering. Let's see, I think there's somebody... I seem, okay. I don't know if I'm supposed to admit other people or are you able to do that? We're taking care of it. Thank no, you. Okay. Awesome. Let's see. All right. Case number three, 35 year old Caucasian female comes in. Well, that's not a female. That's a male. I forgot to change that. I'm sorry about that. Who comes in with papules and pustules and kind of a flush regions in the face, in the nose. And then you see in the medial cheek, um, behind the papules and pustules, you see telangiectasia. Telangiectasias are those, um, you'll see kind of like superficial blood vessels and, and erythema means redness without any white or black heads, AKA no comedones, which means, you know, it's not acne states that she just ate some spicy Thai food, not too recently. Uh, and then diagnosis is, and this is, you'll hear this a lot. A lot of people know about this, but don't, don't know, you know, they don't really know about the certain condition. And this is what we call uh, acne rosacea or papulopustular rosacea. There are different stages to rosacea. And so it's more common in women 30s to 50s. It's a, cr a chronic inflammatory condition with, um, it can be just a red patch. So it can just be a red uh, redness around the nose and the cheek. Once you start growing kind of like acne or papule, uh, papules or pustules, it becomes stage two rosacea. And then stage three is, is becomes more confluent. Um, and so you don't see any comedones. It's basically flush regions and it has triggers. So hot, spicy food, uh, alcohol, sunlight, hot beverages. And usually we treat this with uh, uh, topical ivermectin or topical uh, metronidazole. Metronidazole is actually uh, a medication we use uh, for certain, you know, non-anaerobic, oh, sorry, anaerobic bacteria. And then ivermectin is a well, everybody knows what ivermectin is after the whole thing with COVID, but it's uh, like a, uh, it's against parasites, against parasite infection, but it's been shown that topical ivermectin is actually super, um, it works super well for with rosacea. And there's, uh, if you go to different cosmetic dermatologists, those super trained doctors, they have um, these brand new cutting edge lasers that also help with uh, rosacea. All right, case number four. You have a 50 year old male patient presents to the clinic with a uh, kind of smooth, uh, non-scarring hairless patch on his scalp. He feels like this occurred with such an abrupt onset. So it happened out of nowhere and he's freaking out as a dermatologist, you're worried that this is an autoimmune disease. And therefore you go ahead and check his TSH. TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone. You check his glucose and his ANA. ANA is an autoimmune marker usually used to diagnose lupus and other autoimmune condition diagnosis. So what is the diagnosis? Um, and so just a little gist about this to give you all an idea. Anytime a patient has an, any autoimmune condition, they're more susceptible to getting another autoimmune condition. Uh, so diabetes, if you have type 1 diabetes, it's an autoimmune condition. You could also end up having hypothyroidism, which uh, could be an autoimmune hypothyroidism, uh, thyroid condition. So this person has something what we call alopecia areata. A lot of people use the term alopecia, but there's so many different types of alopecia that can cause hair loss. So alopecia areata is a smooth non-scarring. So if you look at the scalp over here, let me see if I can annotate. Oh, well, I'll try to figure it out later. So it's abrupt onset uh, and people just have, uh, you lose hair, there's no scarring. 
Uh, there's no thickening of the, because they're different scarring slash non-scarring alopecia. And the scarring ones would leave a uh, kind of thickening of the skin. And so, and then the nails can be involved and it's called uh, tracheonychia. And if I could go back, if you look at the picture all the way on the right, tracheonychia just means ridging. And you can see in the middle finger, there's these two white ridges and it's also super thick. That's what trachea, uh, tracheonychia mean. All right. We have case number five, 40 year old woman, uh, 40 year old female presents with photosensitivity with ragged cuticles, uh, red, pink, purple papules on her eyelids, as well as her joints. And the MCPs are the metacarpal phalangeal joints. She says that she has an itchy scalp and that she cannot raise her arm to scratch it. So she has proximal weakness. She can't raise her arm kind of above the 90 degree level. Uh, she also cannot stand, uh, uh, stand up out of her chair, also proximal weakness in the legs. And this is kind of a classic board question. Uh, all these cases um, you'll see as a medical student, whether it's on your exam or on your step one or step two. And so we can see these uh, violaceous papules on the knuckles. And then you can see her eyelids a little dark. And then you can see this thing right there on her upper back in the picture. It's called the shawl sign. So it's kind of a lacy red rash. This is super, super classic textbook um, dermatomyositis. It's an autoimmune inflammatory disorder. And so, and it could be a sign of internal malignancy in adults. That means this could have presented because they have either an ovarian, which is the most common is ovarian cancer, but it could also have like GI cancer too. Clinical manifestation, heliotrope rash, which is the rash above the eyelids, photosensitivity, uh, those uh, violaceous papules, uh, sorry, the ones that we saw on her knuckles, it's called Grotron's papules. And then you have the shawl sign. There's another sign. It's more on the side of the hip. It's called the holster sign because, you know, the gun holster. And then rugged cuticles, which is the fingernails. And the workup would be a, a biopsy. So you'd biopsy and you see uh, kind of infl inflammation within the skin. But then you can also do these markers, which is aldolase, uh, creatinine kinase, ANA, anti jo and anti-me. Uh, there's a, and the dermatomyositis is, it's, it's a mix of rheumatology and dermatology. So a lot of these patients, you'll see they'll have a rheumatologist as well as a dermatologist. And so there's a 30% risk of malignancy and that's a, it's a sign of internal malignancy. Most common malignancy in, in women is going to be ovarian cancer. All right. This is also very common. A lot of people know what it is. You know, people, you get a little dark. So you have a 31 year old female, ignore the G2P1. That's kind of a OB presentation. So G2 means she was pregnant twice, gravita two. P1 para is how many she delivered. Zero, zero is something else. Uh, and then one is how many alive children they have. But this is a dermatology lecture. I'll let the OB lectures in the future do that thing. So it presents with thickening, uh, thickening or darkening, uh, uh, not thickening, darkening of her forehead. Um, and so what is the diagnosis? I'll give you all a clue that this usually happens to women when they start taking oral contraceptive pills or um, they start, uh, you know, when they become pregnant. Super common. Melasma is what it's called in the mask of pregnancy hyperpigmentation because there's increased in melanin production. Uh, and here's just a little, another kind of cool fact that you can tell people in a party or something that uh, when we have people from different skin colors, so we have, you know, the typical fair skinned, uh, fair skinned uh, person to a darker skinned individual. It's not because you have more melanocytes, which are the cells that create the melanin. It's because they have more melanosomes or their melanocytes are more hyperproductive, like they, they produce more. That's why we have different people in the spectrum of different colors, not because they have more of the pigment producing cell. We all have typically about the same amount of melanocytes. Uh, and so treatment for this is sunscreen. It can help. Uh, and then there's glycolic acid and other kind of cosmeceuticals that you can use to help um, decrease uh, hyperpigmentation. All right. So I know this is a very up close picture. I was, when I made this uh, presentation, I was trying to be cool with it. Uh, but you see kind of this 
super aggressive looking lesion. So 61 year old male presents with moles on his back that he's had for many years. His wife wanted him to get them checked out. He has worked in construction for 45 years. What is the diagnosis? So worked in construction, you can imagine they're out in the sun. They don't really, you know, don't typically use sunscreen. Um, and so what do you think this is? This is the very dangerous uh, skin cancer. So melanoma, uh, melanoma. Prognosis depends. You don't need to. This is more of a med school thing as well as like residency. Breslow's depth is basically when you get a biopsy or that you basically excise the whole thing and put it under a mi microscope. And top of the grant, and we know the skin has four layers. Usually you have the stratum corneum granule layer, uh, the stratum spinosum, as, as well as the basal layer. And so from the granule layer, uh, which is, uh, and then you measure that, the dermatopathologist will measure that all the way until the deepest uh, site of the, the deepest site of the melanoma. And the bigger the depth, obviously the more aggressive the cancer. So first thing we do is excise the lesion with a good margin too. Uh, and then if it's above 0.8 millimeters, uh, you need a sentinel lymph node biopsy. So basically the lymph, the closest, the most proximal lymph node you have, you will check that lymph node. You'll send them uh, to uh, interventional radiology and they'll get a sentinel lymph node biopsy because that's when you're worried like, hey, did this spread? And melanoma is pretty aggressive. And I worked with a pathologist. So I did an elective in pathology during my intern year. And if, and you can ask any pathologist, never, never, even if the biopsy was within the body. So somebody came in with lung cancer or something or anywhere in the body and the surgeon sends it to pathologist. They always, always, always rule out melanoma because melanoma can look like anything. It can be anywhere. And that's a scary thing. All right. So Case number eight, 27 year old African American female kind of presents uh, with skin cage, uh, skin changes in her uh, skin in multiple area. She says it's you know it's making her uncomfortable, giving her anxiety. Uh, she's super soft, and, and, and usually people with this condition, um, you know, they have anxiety, they have comorbid kind of psychiatric illnesses because unfortunately sometimes society looks at them differently. And uh, what does she have? Describe the pathology of her condition. So this lady has vitiligo, also very common. Uh, it's, and it, this is an autoimmune condition too. So it's an autoimmune destruction of the melanocytes in the basal layer. So your body basically attack an autoimmune condition. When we say autoimmune, it means the body programs certain antibodies to attack itself. So with type one uh, diabetes, you have certain antibodies in your body that are attacking your pancreas and that's not causing you to produce insulin. And that's why people with type one diabetes are insulin dependent. And with vitiligo, you're destroying the melanocytes that I mentioned uh, briefly earlier uh, in your basal skin layer. So it's not even hypopigmented, hypopigmented. It means uh, there's less mel uh, melanin. This is actually depigmented. It's completely just absent of pigment. And which is why it's like, a complete demarcation where you have uh, different skin. So even in fair skin individuals, you'll see the difference between kind of like fair skin, like white skin versus depigmented skin is just completely gone. Common sites, knees, elbows, around the mouth, and as well as the eyes and in the anal genital area too. And unfortunately, some people, it may start uh, in, the, uh, in the anal genital area or protected areas, and they will never mention it uh, to, uh, to the dermatologist and, the, and, and then it'll start spreading to the hands. And then that's when it becomes worrisome to them. Uh, Kebner phenomenon, what Kebnerization or Kebner phenomena is, uh, he was a very old doctor. I, I don't know if it was in the 1800s and 1900s, but he noticed that certain conditions, when you have trauma to the skin, it incites the condition. And vitiligo is one of those conditions. So let's say, you know, God forbid you get in a car crash and you really like, you know, smack your hand on the, you know, or you smack your hand, you smack your knees on something, there's trauma to it. And it doesn't have to be a car crash. It can be any trauma. You fall down and scrape your knee or you scrape your elbows. You've caused trauma to that skin. And what happens in that site of trauma, you'll get a vitiligo patch or another common condition that has Kebner, uh, Kebner phenomena would be psoriasis. Then you get a psoriasis plaque in that elbow. 
Um, so that's uh, that's what it's called the Kebner phenomena. Okay. Case number nine. Uh, we have a mother of a healthy 16 month old girl comes into your office saying she, that she's worried that her daughter may have an allergic reaction. She loves running and playing in the yard, but she's now developed uh, these spots in her arms. What are you most concerned of? Uh, what's the diagnosis? What are you most concerned of? So no other spots. She's a 60 month year old girl. Uh, vitiligo, I'm going to tell you, it's not vitiligo. It's less common and super, super, uh, obviously it can happen. Anything can happen at different ages, but vitiligo tends to happen later uh, in age, usually younger adults. So this is uh, more of a genetic condition. We call it an Ashleaf macule. If she just has one, it's not concerning. If she has three or more, it could be um, a concerning sign of tuberous sclerosis, which is this genetic condition. Um, it's a very sad condition. They end up having these plaques kind of in the brain. Um, and they usually end up tend to die young. A lot of genetic conditions uh, end up having uh, dermatological manifestations too. So this is lesser, you know, lower yield, more for the board exam. I'm just trying to give y'all common cases that let's say you uh, found a dermatologist that you're going to shadow. You'll see some of these cases, maybe not this one. This one's quite rare, uh, a little less common. Uh, but the first cover, uh, first cases that I mentioned, you'll probably see that in a typical day um, in a dermatology office. Okay, same that this one's also very typical. 72-year-old female, past medical history of lupus, presented with a new lesion on her lip. I don't know why there was a percentage sign. On exam, she has a hyperkeratotic, so super thickened, ulcerated, so it's a little ulcerated, and a nodular papule on her lower lip. What is the diagnosis? And here's when I mention pathology, pathology is the study of uh, basically diseases. Uh, the way we describe it is microanatomy uh, because you'll biopsy it and then you look at it under the, the, the microscope. This is squamous cell carcinoma, hyperkeratotic crusting appearance. It can be friable. That means it can easily bleed and it can happen if you're immunosuppressed, if, you, if you're a smoker, um, history of HPV um, or radiation. Let's say somebody had throat cancer and they got radiation um, to the throat. You still have a whole area that's also been exposed to radiation and keratin pearls, keratin pearls. Um, God, I wish I had that. There's a little pink circle kind of, if you look at the second picture um, and you see that pink circle um, in the kind of lower right corner, a little above the corner, that's a keratin pearl. Um, it, we look at that. It's very common in squamous cell carcinoma. And do you see how the, on the first image, the picture or uh, the squamous cell is on the lower lip. There's a little mnemonic you learn. And uh, I learned it from this, uh, study resource that a lot of med students use called pathoma. And the pathologist said that it's BS. So B would be basal cell carcinoma, which is the most common type of, uh, skin cancer in the world, uh, in the world and most common type of cancer. And then you have BS and the lower lip is the S, which is squamous cell carcinoma. Obviously it's not, it's a hard and fast. It's, uh, it's not a hard and fast rules. It can, you can have basal cell on the lower lip too. Uh, but it's a good differentiating factor. Um, and so this one's on lower lip. So you're thinking, oh, could be a squamous cell, but always biopsy it to confirm. All right. Case 11, uh, we have an older male who presents with this thing on his face. So the, this thing, uh, it's more what we would describe as a pearly, uh, because you can see kind of like this pearly appearance on the right image, uh, pink papule, because it's a raised lesion. Um, I think I, I don't know if y'all are willing, I can come back and kind of give y'all basic uh, description because you have to, the key to an, uh, to dermatology is describing the morphology of the skin lesion. So there's a thing called a macule. If you hear macules, papules. And so, um, I will make another lecture about that and hopefully come down, uh, somewhere in the future, I'll come back and give that lecture again. And so this thing is a basal cell carcinoma, uh, most common, type of cancer and it's a malignant proliferation of the basal cells. So I mentioned that the lower, the lowest uh, layer of the cell is the basal cells. Um, and so it's very common caused by uh, UVB damage, which is basically increased sunlight. 
um, and the histology, you'll see something called peripheral palisading. So it'll form this giant collection right here and on the sides, it almost looks like, that's why they say peripheral palisading. It looks like a picket fence. Um, pathology is super hard on everybody. It still baffles me. I don't know the, you know, I know the basics of it, but a third or a fourth of uh, dermatology residency is dermatopathology. So we do have to know all this by the time we finish. And so physical um, PE just says uh, kind of like what you would see in your physical exam. It's this pearly pink papule. You'll see telangiectasia, those superficial blood uh, uh, vessels, and it could be friable. So you could also like rub on it and it can start bleeding and it become, and it become painful. The good, uh, not the good thing. So basal cell carcinoma, the good thing is if you take it, get it taken out, it's, there's a almost a hundred percent cure rate. Uh, but if you leave it there for a while, it doesn't, it's very, very rare for it to metastasize, but it is very locally aggressive and it grows. It's a very slow growing, but it's very destructive. So some people I've seen, um, I've worked with a prisoner population uh, in Galveston when I did an aware rotation over there. And this person had a basal cell carcinoma on the tip of the nose and left it there for a year. So it became super aggressive to where they had to excise the whole nose almost. Um, so they can be pretty bad. Let's see. So case number 12, you have a 27 year old male presents with a rash kind of running down his right leg. Um, he says that yesterday his leg looked different, but had the same kind of rash. It's super itchy physical exam. You see this edematous. So kind of edematous means there's, uh, it looks kind of swollen erythematous, which is redness and pruritic wheels. So very itchy. Some of the wheels appear to be resolving. So they're kind of fading away and some are newly formed diagnosis. What is the diagnosis? You usually see this when people are allergic to something. You can see this also, like, let's say somebody is like super allergic to bees or peanuts and they eat it. They go into anaphylaxis and this is the first thing that pops up in their skin besides the shortness of breath. But you could also have this without being anaphylactic. Um, very common. Uh, urticary are hives. The, migrating means they're in different spots of your body and they typically last in less than 24 hours. Uh, usually happens with an inciting event or an inciting allergen. So there's an, you might have, it could be just dust mites at home or anything uh, and you get allergies and it, it'll pop up and it usually goes away less than 24 hours. Uh, we call it acute um, urticaria if it's less than six weeks. So if you have these symptoms, uh, so they'll go away and then they come back a week later, but it then just resolves less than six weeks. And then if it's chronic, um, like over six weeks, that's when we start doing a workup. You could have a chronic infection that could look like it. We might want to biopsy it to see if it's, uh, it could be something malignant too. A lot of things, uh, can malignancy could be a lot of things. Um, and so think of the skin as like the canvas and your internal organs kind of paint as to what happens on the skin, because you could have something happen in your heart it can present on the skin. So if somebody has endocarditis, which is um, infection of the heart valve, uh, is like aortic valves or mitral valves, it can present on the skin as different types of skin lesion. If somebody has problems with their liver, it can present with different things in the skin. Somebody has problem, you know, you name it. Uh, you know, if you could have an infection, uh, it can present on the skin. So whatever body system that you can think of, if there's an infection or there's something going on with that system, there's bound to be a disease within that system that presents on the skin. Uh, and so treatment for this is avoiding of irritants and allergens and just oral antihistamines such as Benadryl, Zyrtec, um, Allegra, any of that can help. All right, case number 13. Um, and then please kind of keep track of time if, if because I know there's supposed to be a 30-minute Q&A session at the end. So just let me know. Uh, I have like 29 cases, so we might not get through all of them. Uh, so just let me know. Uh, case number 13, we have a 48 year old female with uh, silvery scaly plaques on her elbows, knees, and abdomen. When you scrape the plaque off, yeah, there's pinpoint bleeding. And uh, on, I guess, joint pain, she has a pencil and cup deformity on the x-ray. So she got an x-ray and that's what the radiologist describes a lot. What's the diagnosis? What's the treatment? What do you never give her? And what's a feared complication? 
So this is what we very common. It's called psoriasis. Um, and it, this is the typical presentation. It's a plaque. A plaque is a raised lesion that's over one centimeter. And you have the silvery scales. And if you actually pick on those scales, you have pinpoint bleeding. And psoriasis can affect your joints and your nails. And you can end up with something called psoriatic arthritis. And again, like I said, rheumatology and dermatology are very go hand in hand with these um, uh, certain conditions. And this is one of them when it becomes psoriatic arthritis. Uh, Treatment, lots of treatments for psoriasis. You start obviously with super strong topical steroids like clobetazole, uh, which helps decrease the inflammation, helps thin the skin a little bit. Um, but some people, there's different types of psoriasis too. So some people will have to get um, what we call biologics, which is these super strong medications that target uh, just these tiny molecules in your body, but have been life-changing for psoriasis patients. So you have adalimumab, which is Humira. I'm pretty sure you see Humira all over the screen. You have uh, different biologics like Skyrizi, which is an IL-17 inhibitor. Um, you have uh, TALTS, um, and now they're coming out with these new JAK inhibitors. Uh, I know some of you may have taken molecular biology. So if you know the JAK stat pathway um, within the cell, that's what these medications target. Uh, and they've been shown to be super effective in a lot of dermatological conditions as well as rheumatological conditions. So never use systemic steroids. It actually, uh, if you start steroids uh, like prednisone, oral prednisone, uh, and you stop it, it can actually cause a reflare and make it even worse. That's why we never use oral steroids. Um, biologics for refractory severe diseases. And the metabolic syndrome. So with psoriasis and even lupus too, there's clon- uh, chronic inflammation with the skin and it increases pro-inflammatory cytokines in your body and it can lead to coronary artery disease. So a lot of things with obesity, actually obesity, people are like, oh, it's just, you know, being obese is not a condition. It actually is because when you're obese, um, the, because you have excess fat cells, they produce a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines or signals in your body. And that inflammation obviously is going to be in your blood vessel and it can cause this uh, kind of plaque formation and it can lead to coronary artery disease. Um, and metabolic syndrome involves type two diabetes and hyperlipidemia, which is cholesterol issues. So psoriasis can lead to that, which is why we tell people to uh, aggressively kind of control their psoriasis. Case 14. This is a, one of the, a lot of people make fun of dermatology that there's not a lot of emergencies in dermatology, which there really isn't, you know, you can probably list them in one hand and this is one of them. So you have a patient, 39 year old male presents to the emergency department with this presentation. What is the diagnosis? So you can see his skin kind of sloughing off. You can see some of these bullas, which are these uh, kind of fluid filled blisters, I guess, blisters, the uh, lay, uh, lay term for, um, a bulla. And this is called pemphigus vulgaris. Uh, you, it's a very aggressive condition and it's an autoimmune condition where you have antibodies that target. Um, I mentioned the four layers of the skin, you know, you have the basal layer and the stratum spinosum, which is the second layer. These cells in the stratum spinosum are connected to each other with things called desmosomes. And so this condition is an autoimmune condition where the antibodies attack the desmosomes. So when you attack the desmosome and you form a blister within this, uh, you basically form a fluid filled blister within uh, the epidermis. And that's what you see over here. Well, a lot, and these are, because it's in the epidermis, it's not very strong. And so these fluid filled blisters actually pop and you can also have sloughing in the skin. So it's flaccid blisters, not tense blisters. And you can have mucosal involvements. It can be in the mouth. And this one's a very aggressive one, super painful. You start them on high dose steroids. Um, And then the immunofluorescence is this green thing on the right. And it looks like a fishnet appearance. A lot of these um, pemphigoid uh, type diseases, there's there's a bunch of them. And we use immunofluorescence sometimes to distinguish one from the other. And so this one has the fishnet appearance. Here's another pemphigus type picture. And this is a 67 year old male presents with the emergency department. 
from a nursing home with this presentation. This one's very common in elderly. What is the diagnosis? This one is tense blisters. They're not very easily popped. You, uh, they're very tense. Uh, usually happens in older uh, people. And they usually start actually as a, a red patch that's super itchy. And so a lot of people are like, oh, it's urticaria. But then it becomes chronic. And that's when we biopsy and, and, and then they start forming blisters later. So it's not just blisters pop up. It can just form as a red patch thing. Um, and then you can see the immunofluorescence. It's linear rather than a fishnet appearance. So this is called bullous pentagoid, deep, tense bullies, not flaccid. And they're common in the elderly. And this one is in the hemidesmosomes. So the basal layer uh, is attached to a basement member. So there's the epidermis and the dermis. Um, and then between them is the basement mender, uh, membrane. And there's a, uh, what they anchor the, um, it's very hard to describe it without a picture, but basically the basement membrane is attached uh, to the epidermis through these hemidesmosomes. And so what happens is you have an autoimmune condition. These antibodies attack these hemidesmosomes and then it detaches them. And now you have a huge blister between them. Um, and so usually very itchy. Um, and then in the immunofluorescence, it's linear. Let me see if we're good on time. Yeah, we're still good on time. Let's see. And Dr. Shelby, you could feel free to also move. Um, you, you go through your presentation in its fullest. Uh, we have time afterwards. So um, okay, we perfect. have a Q&A session. So we're good. Awesome. I'm trying to get the pointer right now. I just, okay, let's see. Do y'all see a mouse or anything? I assume not. We don't see a mouse, but if you click on annotate and then you can click on the, did you click on the mouse option? And you're yeah, or draw, let's see, draw. Or arrow. Yeah. Hmm, that's interesting. I clicked on the mouse, but it's not showing, it's okay. That's fine. All right. So case 16, also very, very common in the elderly. Uh, many different names because we don't, you know, a lot, we usually call them wisdom spots. We don't uh, call them age spots. A lot of people will call these um, um, barnacles, but that's when somebody says a barnacle, that's what this looks like. So you have a 70 year old patient with this new mole and it has this waxy stuck on appearance that sometimes can itch, sometimes can bleed. Um, what do you think this is? So super common, this is called a seborrheic keratosis. It's sharply marginated. That means you can see the border around it. It can be all over the body. People can have up to a hundred basically. Uh, very common, very benign. Usually people just don't like it because it's sometimes it can, uh, doesn't look uh, very appealing to the eyes. The color can be variable because uh, you can have traumatic ones that turn like uh, darker blue or red or can have redness around it. Uh, sometimes, you can have a melanoma that looks like an SK though. So you'll hear a dermatologist call this SK rather than just the full term. Um, but let's say somebody had one and then next week went to their dermatologist and had like 50 or over a hundred because it was such in a short span of time. That's called the sign of treasure lay, uh, sign of treasure lay lot. Um, and that is actually a sign of potential malignancy, and it could be a gastric adenocarcinoma. So if somebody has one or two, but when they turn 70, they end up having, you know, if somebody's in their 40s and by the time they turn 70, they have a bunch, that's fine because it, they, they come and go. Um, but if somebody within a week developed like 50 or 70, that's when we're like, okay, this is concerning. They need to get checked out. And this is what I mean by, you know, your skin is a canvas. And whatever happens inside your body, it starts painting on the canvas. And we have these signs that we can look at. Very common. What do y'all think this is? A lot of people have it. Um, it's very uh, common in friction areas. So between the neck, kind of in your axilla or the what we call intertriginous area where the skin rubs against the skin. So where you uh, kind of anal, uh, sorry, like um, the groin area where the, the groin as well as the um, the thigh area, it can happen in the neck, it can happen in the armpit uh, type, those areas. This is called a skin tag, um, but the scientific term is an acrocordon. Um, where they be? I don't know <laughs> why I said that. Uh, where are they? 
eyelids, neck, axilla. Uh, why was I so blessed with these? It, again, genetics, friction, uh, pregnancy, and it can actually be a marker of insulin resistance. So if somebody has a lot of these and they're like, hey, I've gained a lot of weight in the past six months. The first thing, obviously, as a doctor, maybe not even certain dermatologists, if they're very uh, good with it, they can check his hemoglobin A1C. So they're like, you know, I'm going to check if you have diabetes because obesity can then lead to type two diabetes because you've become insulin resistance. And that could be the sign, you know, these skin tags, if you have a bunch of them and this person, let's say never had access to healthcare, you could be the person to just say, Hey, let me just run a couple of, um, you know, blood tests on you. Case 18, 24 year old female cuts, uh, comes in with a new growth. Um, when uh, she cuts herself, when sh shaving appeared six months ago. Um, and she says that edges, um, so I can't see this thing is blocking it, but what happens, it feels firm and feels like a scar and it actually has a dimple sign. So if I was to kind of squeeze it, it dimples uh, in the middle. And this is very, very common in females in the lower extremity. So if you have uh, a female patient who comes in with similar looking appearance and it's in the lower extremity, this is what we call a dermatofibroma. It's benign. It's a firm dome on extremities, usually lower extremities, and it dimples on squeezing. And that's typical board case question. I've seen this multiple times. 57-year-old female, so case 19, with numerous asymptomatic bumps on her dome arising slowly over the last five years. What is the diagnosis? Um, again, acne, very common. Uh, when you hit puberty, even common uh, when ba babies can have acne too, because when they, uh, when the, um, their mother gives birth, um, they still have her hormones. And we know that horm uh, acne can also be hormonal. And so you can have neonatal acne. So, but if somebody comes in with 57 years old, obviously your first thing, you know, acne can still happen at that age, but very uncommon. So this is something a lot of people will mistake with acne, but it's actually called sebaceous hyperplasia, which is the enlargement of the sebaceous gland and it can give it a yellow color and it's a cosmetic issue. Nothing to worry about. I think I've heard dermatologists use uh, tretinoin or retinoids. I know people use retinol for anti-aging. Uh, retinol can help also. It basically dries out the skin, which is why they tell you uh, not to use it too often, but because of the drying side effect, it kind of shrinks the sebaceous gland and make them look better. Uh, and then you have different cosmetic uh, treatments for sebaceous hyperplasia, but nothing, nothing too worrisome. And you could have uh, these sebaceous glands. You can notice some sebaceous gland on some people's uh, lips and they'll show as white, yellow lip, uh, white, yellow dots. And that's called like Fordici spots. And that's actually sebaceous glands. Case number 20, very common in kids, super common, seven year, uh, seven year old, uh, brought into pediatrician by a father and presents, uh, with this condition and it looks umbilicated. Uh, it's raised and it's umbilicated. What is the diagnosis? Actually the treat, the most common, so the treatment for this is reassurance because usually they tend to go away, but a lot of parents have you know, something against it. Cause it is cosmetic. They don't want their kids to have it. Obviously we treat it if it was in the eyelid or something, uh, but it's not very good treatments. Uh, the best thing is like, Hey, just wait it out. It'll go away. Um, but this is molluscum contagiosum. It's super benign common in kids and it spreads and it can spontaneous resolve in month, but there's different ways we can treat it. We have like cryonitrogen that we use to freeze certain precancerous conditions. Um, I know like obviously you don't want to freeze the kid. It is kind of, uh, it stings. And so you would pour some into a plastic cup and get one of those long Q-tips and you just dip it in and dip it in for a couple of seconds. And then you'll point it at the, the lesion and you just leave it there for a couple of seconds and then just continue to continue to do that. Um, so it's very fun. Uh, I, I like these lesions. I think the biggest thing is you just reassure them because some, uh, that sometimes they can be widespread um, and it worries the, the parents. And so you just have to console the parents about it. Now, I didn't put it here, but let's say you have an older person, more like 55 years old, 
and he has a bunch of these. Molesting contagiosum can happen in elderly, but the first red flag would be you have to check that patient um, for HIV because it's an HPV or a pox virus type infection. And on normal individuals who are not immunosuppressed, they do not have molluscum contagiosum. It's, a, it's just mainly common in children, very common in pediatrics. But if you have an older person, then you would ask about uh, what their sexual history is, sexual behavior, uh, and then you would test them for HIV. Because sometimes you can have that happen. Let's see, six-year-old man, uh, case 21, we have like eight more cases left. Please bear with me. Uh, urgent care clinic for a rash in his right arm, the rash is sudden. Let's see, I can't see because there's like a bar in the middle and I can't take it out. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. I'm trying to get rid of the bar and it just won't let me. Uh, let me see what I can do. Maybe if I st stop sharing and then yeah. take it out, but then I don't have a mouse for some reason. I can also sh screen share on my end. That's easier. Okay. This is better. This is better. I think y'all can still see, right? No, you, you stop screen sharing. Oh. Sorry. Let's see. Okay, let me screen share one more time. I'm just going to move the bar somewhere else. Let's share now. Okay, do y'all see it? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. Sorry about the technical difficulties. No worries. Thank you. So we have a 60-year-old a uh, man presents to the urgent care clinic with a rash in his right arm, reports that the rash has suddenly occurred about a day ago, had been a 10 out of 10 pen from the rash. It's burning, uh, it's itching, and there's a physicular rash and a dermatomal distribution in the right upper arm. Uh, I wish I added a picture. I think I forgot to add a picture to this one. Uh, but this is common, super common. And the keyword is dermatomal distribution. And this is shingles or a uh, very zoster virus infection, very common in the elderly. You treat it with acyclovir, which is an antiviral medication. And then that's why patients above the age of 50 should receive the shingles vaccine. Uh, everybody has, um, you know, herpes simplex virus. You know, it's the cold sore that you get. A lot of people have it. This type of virus remains dormant in your nerves. And then there could be stress can be the incited factors. Sometimes you get it during stress, but varicella zoster virus is kind of like a cousin of it. This one, same thing, remains dormant in the nerve. And this one's actually triggered mainly through um, immunosuppression. And that's why, what, you know, as you, as you age, your immune system gets weaker. And so anybody who's age 50 or above starts getting the shingles vaccine, but then anybody who gets a transplant. So if you're 25 years old and you need a kidney transplant or a liver transplant, you'll also get the shingles vaccine because the transplant makes you immunosuppressed. Um, having HIV or AIDS, uh, starting chemotherapy, those can be inciting factors for you to get shingles basically. And it's, it starts out usually as just this burning pain. There's no rash. So I had, I have this super cool case that I'm actually presenting at a conference. This person came in with like a headache and he was like, it's it, my head hurts. It's like on this side of the head and it's burning and it's killing me. And, and then he came to the ER the next day and he was like, Oh, now I have a rash. So before the rash came, this person presented with just a headache and burning pain in his head. And then a day later, the rash presented, which is very common for shingles. And it can happen anywhere. It can happen kind of like dermatoma over here, in the ears, uh, in the chest, in the abdomen, usually. Okay, case 22, you have a seven-year-old boy brought to the emergency room for a cough, high fever, and a rash. Also reports having itchy eyes in the past day. Uh, rash started on his head and neck and then traveled downwards toward his trunk, which is kind of the chest area, abdomen, and the back. On physical exam, he has a confluent. So basically confluent means kind of uh, merging together. 
maculopapular rash. Macule is flat, papular, raised. So there's a mix of raised and flat lesions that blanches with pressure. Blanches with pressure is you take your finger and you press on it. It turns white. So the, uh, the blood in there just blanches. So same thing, it blanches. There are blue white macules in the background, in the buccal mucosa. So that's the top picture over there. What is the diagnosis? Super uh, not common, thankfully. Used to be very common, but thanks to vaccinations and everything that you get uh, when you're a baby, very uncommon. Unfortunately, there has been endemic rises in this condition because there are a lot of anti-vax parents that are against vaccinating their parents. And this is actually measles or rubiola. Um, and once when the vaccine came, it actually decreased the incidence by a lot, almost basically made it non-existent. Uh, and so you have the rash that erupts five to seven days after the symptoms. So you can have a fever and cough for five to seven days before it comes out. Um, and the way we treat it, believe it or not, is we give them vitamin A. It's mainly supportive treatment, you know, make sure that the fever is taken care of. But there have been studies that show that uh, vitamin A in inpatient, so in the hospital, can help uh, decrease the hospital stay. So thankfully, not as common. And, uh, but it is very common, obviously overseas where cer certain areas, uh, don't have, um, I guess, uh, the vaccinations that we do or health access like we do. Case 23 mother brings in her eight-year-old child because he has something under his hair. And then you have this kind of growth. Um, and this is something called the nevus sebaceous of Jadasan or nevus sebaceous is what all the dermatologists call it. It has this orange peel type appearance to it. Uh, it very common, I think when you're like five or seven and it can grow until your adolescence. And basically it's a plaque, it's yellow tan appearance. It can look verrucous. Verrucous is kind of like wart-like appearance. Uh, it's a can present at birth and grows with the child. And pediatric dermatologists kind of mixed in this. A lot of people will just biopsy it when you turn into adolescence. Some people say, oh, it's, you know, don't worry about it. If the person, you know, if the kid is three years old, they're like, don't worry about it. It's going to grow. Uh, but if it keeps growing, then we'll biopsy it. Some say that there is a secondary malignancy risk that you can grow a skin that increases, slightly increases the risk of skin cancer in that spot. So not very well known still. Patient comes in with this presentation. It's the kind of darkness around the neck. This is a sign of either insulin resistance and obesity or internal malignancy. Like I said, it's a canvas and the body just uh, paints on the skin. And this is called akinthosis nigricans. It happens in intertriginous areas, which are areas where the skin rubs on the skin. So the neck fold uh, under the arm, uh, basically the armpit, kind of in the groin area. And so it's super benign. And if it's a younger population, so if anybody 40 and under comes in with this, think insulin resistance probably has type two diabetes or something. They're probably, you know, they're probably overweight or obese. But if you have somebody who's older, 60, 70 years old, and has something like this, then we definitely want to rule out a gastric adenocarcinoma because it could be that it could be hepatocellular. That's HCC is hepatocellular carcinoma, which is a lung cancer or a lung cancer. Uh, sorry, a liver cancer, or it could be lung cancer. Think older, non-obese patients. So you still have to rule it out. Mother brings in her nine-year-old child because she, uh, she, she's constantly itching in her head. She has this bald spot with some crusting and flaking. Now, I want you to distinguish this from the picture I had of alopecia areata. That one was a smooth skin. You can see the scalp. This one, you can see there's flaking, there's crusting. It's super itchy. Uh, what is the diagnosis? This is also common in African-American patients too. And this is tinea capitis. Uh, it's a dermatophyte infection, a fungal infection in the head. It can cause bald spots um, and usually causes alopecia. Alopecia is not, it, it can, it, alopecia is just the name of it is just loss of hair. And the type of fungus is trichophyton tonsurans. Uh, does not fluoresce through woods lamp. You don't need to know that for now. Treatment is oral griseofulvin, which is an antifungal or oral terbenafin. Oral terbenafine is more often used because it has a less side effect profile than griseofulvin. Griseofulvin is kind of an old school medication. 
Case 26, very common in the summer. 21-year-old male who's a lifeguard comes into the office because he has this rash in his back, spends time in the sun, does not use sunscreen, uh, not biopsy was taken. This is more of a scraping. You don't want to biopsy of this. You can just scrape it and diagnose it. Um, what is the diagnosis? You see the pathology uh, on the on the top picture. We just scrape it and then just uh, put a solution to it. And just we could do this during your visit. So if I see somebody come into the office and I see that, I'll scrape it, tell them, hey, give me five minutes, put it in a slide, put the solution in and just pop it under a microscope and I can see those things up there. And that is called spaghetti and meatball appearance. I don't know if y'all see it, but those long branched hyphae are uh, the, the long, uh, I guess, line looking things. We call them hyphae. Uh, those are like the spaghetti and the grouped ones are the meatballs. So very common. Uh, this is called tinea versicolor. Uh, it's a fungal infection. The spaghetti meatball appearance over there it can cause hyperpigmentation, hypopigmentation. It kind of presents with those hypopigmented macules typically in the summer. And you can use selenium, uh, selenium, selenium sulfide or like ketoconazole shampoo or anything to treat it or ketoconazole cream. Um, very, very common. Um, nothing to worry about. So this one, you have a baby, a uh, healthy young girl concern, and then the mom brings it in. Uh, because she's concerned that the, her baby has is bruised all over. What is the diagnosis? Um, you never, ever want to not rule out abuse also. And unfortunately, a lot of, you know, pediatrician will look at the parent and they're like, okay, because it does look like super bad. Like, hey, they're super bruised. Did they drop them on purpose? All that. But this is something that uh, very common back in the days, they used to also like worry that, something happened to the baby, but now we know it very well. Used to be called Mongolian spots. Obviously, there's a lot of terms in medicine that are being changed. So now it's con called congenital dermal melanocytosis, very pop uh, prevalent in the Asian population, Middle Eastern population. And it's uh, the uh, delayed disappearance of dermal melanocytes. Uh, you have blue gray uh, patches or macules that fade by the second year, usually goes away by itself. And then you have in the sacral gluteal region, which is basically the buttocks region. Nothing. You don't need to do anything for them. All right. Case number 28. Mother brings in her four-year-old child because of a painful golden yellow like lesion underlying uh, erythema. So you can see the gold crust right here. Um, it's, this one is infectious, super common, very common. And this is a superficial kind of bacterial infection we call, um, uh, empitigo two to five years old, very common in that age. You know, kids, you'd be surprised, uh, how many people I've seen, uh, um, in the emergency room who are adults. And typically those adults are either elementary school teachers or they work at, um, at a daycare. You know, there's a study that showed like with pediatrics, a third of the complaints in a pediatric clinic is actually dermatology related uh, because kids have everything basically. And so the, you have this painful honey crusted lesion with underlying erythema. So within under it, you have this redness. It's a group A strep uh, type infection. And then there's also staph aureus, which is a bacteria. Group A strep is a bacteria. Staph aureus is a bacteria. Um, and in, in medical school, you have to know which causes, which, um, obviously there's multiple bacteria that can cause the same thing, but you're, you should know which one is the most common one that causes. So for empatigo group, a strep is the most common bacteria that causes it. Let's say I was asking you about community acquired pneumonia. Well, the most common cause of community acquired pneumonia would be, um, no, I'll just blank. It's called streptococcus pneumoniae. And, but you have different other bugs that can cause pneumonia, but it's always good to know the most common. This is non bullous bullous means blister staphylococcus aureus causes bullous, um, empatigo. And so if it's a bullous, if you see a blister with the golden crust, then it's probably staph aureus. If it's non bullous, then you treat it with uh, bactroben or mopirocin, which is a topical antibiotic never use neosporin. A lot of dermatologists are against neosporin. It was very much overused in the early 2000s and 90s that now uh, a lot of bacteria are resistant to it. And neosporin can cause a lot of allergic or contact dermatitis too. 
if it is bullous, then you have to use oral antibiotics because it's a more uh, serious infection. I believe this is the last case. Uh, let's see. We have a 51-year-old female past medical history of obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, so cholesterol issues, comes into office due to acute onset uh, of pain in her knees. She drinks a lot of alcohol. Physical exam shows first, uh, the first MTP metacarpal metatarsal. So this is uh, basically her big toe is swollen, red, and warm. They tapped the, the joint and it showed negative, right? So this is more of not very common in dermatology, but a lot of people will go to a dermatologist because again, it made the skin look red and some people will wait like three months to see a dermatologist and the dermatologist is like, hey, this is more something that you need to go to your primary care doctor to take care of. So the diagnosis with this, let's say this person's obese, eats a lot of red meat uh, and they had to, so basically the, the joint is super swollen and it's super red and it's super painful. And so just because it happens in the skin doesn't mean you need to necessarily see a dermatologist because this is gout. And so gout is not, you know, it's not really treated with dermatologists. It's usually your internal medicine physician doctor or your family physician doctor, um, or even rheumatology. Rheumatologists take care of gout too. Um, and treatments is NSAIDs, which is basically ibuprofen or naproxen. You can use uh, steroids, not oral steroids, more inject steroids. And then colchicine, colchicine is a super strong drug for like a flared gout. If it is chronic gout, use allopurinol. Uh, allopurinol basically decreases your body's production of uric acid. And then febuxostat prevenicid, same, almost like similar type thing. Avoid triggers like alcohol, red meat. Uh, I was in a clinic month, two weeks ago, and I can't tell you, I have had at least four patients with gout. Uh, a lot of them are overweight. And so my biggest thing is like avoid red meat, don't drink beer, don't drink alcohol and try to lose weight. Those will help because gout can be de debilitating. You're always going to be in pain. Your joint's going to hurt. Um, and so, and then they'll have to go get a steroid shot and the steroid shots also hurt. Um, I wish I had a picture. So you can search up like gout pictures and you can see they could super flare up. Let's see. All right. That was it. Thank y'all for, um, putting up with kind of the technical difficulties. Um, thank you for your attention. And um, this is, uh, I put in a QR code. So I do, a I do offer a lot of pre-med tutoring as well on the side. I work for Med School Insiders, but I do offer it on the sides for anybody who's pre-med, who needs help on the side, more one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and then I'm also on Instagram. I kind of post stuff too about med school residency. And I'm more than happy to answer any DMs if, you kind of want to reach out to me on the side. Um, so please feel free to scan it, follow, do whatever you want with it. Awesome. Thank y'all. And now I think we'll open it up for the Q and a. Uh, thank you so much for a great presentation. I'm sure a lot of people will take you up on that offer. Um, I'm Robin. I am a PhD student at, at Johns Hopkins. I work with teleshadowing. Um, so we have some awesome. questions for you. If you have time. Yeah, of course. Yeah. All right. Um, so this is sort of a general interest question because a lot of our viewers are late teens, early 20s. So there were some questions about like hormonal changes that lead to simple acne versus more complicated <laughs> acne and sort of best yeah. practices in your life to avoid these issues. Awesome. Yeah. So kind of typical acne, we have the normal papular pustular acne you would get on forehead. Um, that usually happens during uh, puberty. And those usually get started out with kind of topical uh, retinoid by itself. And if that's not working, then they start topical antibiotics and uh, benzoyl peroxide wash at, in the shower. If that doesn't work or it gets worse, then we start with topical antibiotics plus oral antibiotics. Uh, we tell them always continue your skincare routine. And then we'll start like doxycycline. If that doesn't work and it becomes more cystic or something like that, that's when you start using like Accutane. But for hormonal, uh, how we see hormonal acne is when a female patient comes into the office and she's like, hey, I really have a flare up a week before my menses start or hormonal acne because it's hormonal. Um, it comes what we call male like distribution. So the uh, the the female patient, she'll have it kind of where the beard area is. You'll have acne there. And they usually use spironolactone. Spironolactone 
is a diuretic, but it also works on the certain androgen receptors and it blocks your hormones acting on those receptors. Cause again, acne can be hormonally influenced. So it kind of blocks it and it helps it clear up. So definitely go to the, if you have certain flare-ups with that, the dermatologist will definitely prescribe spironolactone. I've heard they started making topical spironolactone. I don't know how um, effective it is, but if anything hormonal acne, if it's red and is pustular, it's most likely, and it's on the cheeks and the, and the forehead, it's most likely not hormonal. It can be, but I don't think it's very uh, most likely not to, but if it's over here in the chin area, um, uh, not chin, sorry, like the beard, like area, the jaw area and the chin, um, even like around the, um, the mouth that tends to be what I see is hormonal acne distribution. All right. Um, we also had a question about alopecia areata. So someone was curious to learn a little bit more about what causes it, what treatment options are. Of course. Yeah. So, uh, alopecia areata, like I said, it's an, um, uh, autoimmune disease. So you have antibodies in your skin, uh, sorry, in your body that target the hair follicles and just destroy the hair follicles. And then within alopecia areata, you can have different types. You can have, uh, alopecia areata universalis, which means the whole head is bald. Um, so the one that I showed you was just localized alopecia areata is just bald patches. You can actually have alopecia areati, uh, areata totalis. Totalis means everywhere in your body, no hair. Um, and it's an autoimmune condition. So it's just, just depends. Some people have it worse than others. It's actually very common in pediatric patients. Some pediatric patients can, uh, do have alopecia areata. Now treatments for alopecia areata. Well, we use minoxidil, you know, Rogaine. So topical Rogaine, uh, you start with that. You can use topical finasteride too. Finasteride is again, uh, kind of an androgen receptor too. We know it's an autoimmune condition, uh, but your hair also has a uh, androgen component to it. So they can use that. Um, they could also use intralesional, uh, steroid injection. So whichever bald spot that there is, or alopecia spot that there is, they can inject under, the, uh, they'll inject, um, what we call Kenalog or triamcinolone, which is a steroid. Cause we know it's an autoimmune condition and then there's an inflammation in that area that's preventing the hair to grow. And so you inject in those areas and what happens that steroid basically calms the area down it decreases inflammation and it allows the hair the chance to grow. And then there are oral medications. So you can take, um, they actually are, I mentioned Jack inhibitors briefly. Um, there are these Jack inhibitors that are on the market. They're starting to be used during clinical trials. And I believe some of them will become FDA approved soon uh, for alopecia areata. They've been shown to be super, super effective. Um, I know. Um, and so those are kind of the treatment options. Uh, it is definitely hard, like the, dealing with the hair. Sometimes hair just takes forever to grow. And another good thing to know just in the back of your hand is it's not necessarily alopecia. If your hair is falling out, your hair cycles a lot. Uh, and so having 25 to hundred hairs shedding a day is actually quite normal. And then that's just alopecia areata. There's also different types of hair loss. You can have something called telogen effluvium. Uh, and what that means is it's usually incited either through pregnancy, stressful event, uh, anything stressful. Like you could be studying, uh, like, you know, I, I seen this actually in some of my classmates, uh, when we took step one, step one is, uh, you know, some people study two months to three months for it. And so they're stressed for two to three months and the stressful event happens. And then three months later, you start like you start shedding hair. Um, intelligent is basically the uh, So your hair growth has three phases. They're antigen, catagen, intelligent. Intelligent is like towards the end. So antigen is the growth phase and it happens, uh, takes three years. Catagen is the transitional phase to go from growing to end terminal hair. That's almost basically three weeks. And then you have telogen, which is basically the terminal hair, like you're done growing and you're going to shut out. And that usually takes about three months. So telogen effusion, uh, if you've, uh, if, sorry, telogen effluvium is where you shed a lot of the telogenic hair. Now I know a lot of people know 
why do people with cancer, like they go bald because of chemotherapy. Unfortunately, chemotherapy targets rapidly dividing skin, uh, sorry, cancer cells. Well, your hair cells are rapidly dividing. Your skin cells are rapidly dividing. So what does the chemotherapy do? It causes antigen effluvium. So when the hairs are growing, the chemotherapy attacks it or like it causes antigen effluvium. So that's what happens with that type of hair loss. There's different types of hair loss too, um, but it is an autoimmune condition if y'all are asking specifically about alopecia areata. It's exciting to hear that there are some new treatments in the pipeline. Yeah. And as if taking exams isn't bad enough, then you start. I know. <laughs> yeah. <your> you just. <laughs> um, so a lot of people notice like small abnormalities on their skin and they ignore them and like hold off on going to a dermatologist or a PCP. What are some things that you think are underreported that people should take more seriously? Yes. So this is as we grow older. Um, it's a lot of people I get myself included, I am guilty of this. And my wife is always on me too. She's like, oh, you're a dermatologist or you're about to be a dermatologist. And why don't you put sunscreen today? I think we don't realize that even when it's cloudy outside, it's the UV rays. Just because you don't see the sunlight doesn't mean the UV rays don't penetrate. You know, you, you can still, some people with super fair skin, it's usually people with the red hair. I think, you know, um, the ginger hair, they tend to be very fair skinned and have a lot of skin cancer. Um, so even with a cloudy day, even applying SPF 30 would help a lot, or let's say it's a super sunny day and you spend all your day in house. Let's say you work from home and you, you don't really go outside. You only go to the store. You only go to the restaurant, you go grocery shopping or whatever you want to do. Um, you forget that you're going to be in the car, hands on the steering wheel. And what's showing on your hand, it's you're, you're still getting hit by direct sunlight in your hand. And there's this crazy photo that if you search up, um, kind of just search up photo aging effect on the skin truck driver, and you'll see this lady who is a truck driver. Um, and you'll see the difference. Uh, and I, and you know, when you're driving your left side is closest to the window. And so she's a truck driver, I think for 20, 30 years, and you'll see the photo, uh, what we call photo aging, uh, basically the sun's effect on your skin because she had chronic exposure to the sun because of her work. And it basically made it all wrinkly. And then you can see the right side of her face, which is almost normal, barely any wrinkles or anything. So I think a lot of people don't take into effect that even getting a sunburn as a kid uh, increases your risk factor for skin cancer. Skin cancer is the most common cancer in the world, most common type of skin, uh, out of all the cancer, it is skin cancer. And the most common one is basal cell. The second one is squamous cell. And you definitely don't want melanoma because it's very dangerous. Um, so I would highly suggest wearing protective clothing. Um, the, if you don't like, you know, putting sunscreen, there are UPF ultra protective type of clothing, but they are kind of expensive. So I would highly recommend wearing anything SPF 30 and above. Uh, kind of taking care of that. And if you see anything suspicious, so there's something we call the ABCDEs of melanoma. A is asymmetry. So look at your little, you know, look at your, um, I would say moles and see if they all kind of look the same. You don't want one to stand out. So you look at asymmetry. Is the color the same on both of them? Um, B is border. How's the border? Is the border like pretty, you know, circular? Is it a good border? Is it like an irregular border? Um, and then C is color. Like I have, I have like a, a brown thing right here. Um, what we call a nevus or a macule and the color is pretty uniform all over. Is there a different, is there a pink color? Is there light Brown and dark Brown? Um, so that's the C D is, um, diameter. How big is the lesion? Do you have like a bunch of small spots and then one big one? So you want to look at it. Is it growing? You could like monitor, it, you know, draw, draw something on it or like measure it and then just you know, a lot of dermatologists like, Hey, we're not going to biopsy it this time. I'm going to measure it. And then when you come back three months later, I'm going to remeasure it. And if it's growing, they're like, okay, this is suspicious. We're going to biopsy it. And then E is evolution. How did it change? Was it flat then become raised? Um, and then there's another one called the ugly duckling sign, which is if you have like 10 different spots and then one spot is the ugly duckling, it looks different. Like, Hey, that's suspicious. Then I would show that to your primary care doctor. Doesn't matter necessarily you have to go to a dermatologist. I would always go through your primary care doctor because everybody, you know, 
no matter which doctor specialty you go to, everybody learns the ABCDEs. Everybody learns about what to look for, what looks suspicious, what, what does not look suspicious, especially primary care doctors, because with a primary care doctors, about one in 10 of their complaints, is going to be skin related. Um, so just kind of tips and tricks uh, about just watching what's suspicious, what's not. So I think after you've been treated for melanoma, you have to go for like annual screening, like checking all of your skin. Is that something you go to a dermatologist for? Or? Yeah. Yeah. So with skin checks, I would definitely go to a dermatologist. I would, but if you have something concerning, show it to your primary care doctor and tell them like, Hey, this has happened. Explain it to them. Then they'll, uh, certain even family doctors can, uh, they do skin biopsies, not very common, but then if they're, you know, worried about it as good clinicians, they would refer you to uh, the expert, the dermatologist. So with melanoma patients, after the melanoma is excised, uh, I believe they follow up every six months for two years and everything looks good. Then it switches to annually. So you do six months, six months, six months, six months, and then it switches to annually. And then, uh, and sometimes, you know, it's sometimes it's up to the preference of the dermatologist. Um, so moving on to a little bit lighter note, um, can you tell us a little more about liquid gold or plasma treatments patients use to treat hair loss or wrinkling? Yes. So PRP, platelet-rich plasma, somebody, somebody asked me about that or platelet, there's PRF now that I just heard about platelet-rich uh, fibrin. So what happens is we have growth factor. Um, in our body, we do have growth factor. And, you know, as a kid, that's what helps you grow. It affects your bones, your muscles, everything. And so, and it's usually within the blood. So what happens in the dermatologist, you go in within the lab, they'll draw blood and they'll put it in a centrifuge. I don't know if y'all have worked in the lab in undergrad, they'll centrifuge it and they split it. And I, I'm pretty sure everybody learned this in undergrad, but they split it. There's like a plasma, there's the white cell, and then there's the platelet uh, area. So platelets have this, um, uh, what's it called the platelet rich plasma or the plasma has these growth factors and it actually has shown to improve or increase, uh, hair growth because it has the growth factors. Um, and it's actually almost like stem cells. What it, what it is you're taking is the platelet rich plasma that has stem cells. It has growth factors and you're injecting it in that area. And it basically stimulates the hair to grow even more. Um, think of it, you know, unfortunately, you know, we're not to the point where we have stem cells to re regrow limbs or neurons or anything, but it has shown to help uh, with hair. Um, and a lot of, so it does take time though. Like it's not immediate. It definitely does take time. Same thing. Anything with hair growth takes time, but it has shown to um, increase it. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't think it's covered by insurance. So a lot of it is um, out of pocket pay but alopecia areata is a medical condition. So anything that we do with prescription, uh, whether it's topical minoxidil or oral uh, medications, or even um, interlesional corticoid, uh, interlesional steroid injections, those tend to be covered, but because platelet rich plasma is still fairly new and the research is still out of it, I don't know many insurance companies that will pay for it because it is kind of expensive. I don't know if y'all have been to a dermatology office or y'all looked at the price of, uh, price of it, but I'm pretty sure it's, close to a thousand, if not a little more than a thousand dollars, but still very, um, I think it's pretty effective. Yes. So you have to decide how much it's worth to you. <laughs> yeah. That's why they call it liquid gold. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the rest of our questions are a little bit more general about your specialty. Um, so yeah. what inspired your passion for dermatology? What made you choose this specialty? Um, so one thing about dermatology, uh, and I, I think I watch, um, I went back into the teleshadowing. I walked, uh, I watched Dr. Shoudery's, uh, her teleshadowing thing. And she said that, you know, it was, it's super competitive. She, she kind of figured it out super late. She had to do a research here and reapply because at first she applied to ophthalmology. And, 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 you know, I think that was, you know, and she's an attending now. Uh, and she was kind of probably training, you know, five, seven years ago. And unfortunately, it's only getting more competitive. So for me, I had dermatology in my mind as a first year, second year, and third year. I just kept that at the back of my mind. And I tried to do the best in my classes and the best in my board exams too. But I did not rule, I, I definitely ruled out other specialties. Um, I, I was like, you know, I want to look at radiology. I want to look at internal medicine, uh, pediatrics, even psychiatry and family medicine. 
Uh, but something always stuck with me with dermatology um, is the fact that it has everything. So in my family medicine rotation, I really love that I could see kids, adults, plus uh, kind of old elderly population geriatrics. In the surgery rotation, I love doing like small procedures, like excisions, suturings, all that stuff. Um, in my internal medicine rotation, you know, you know, sitting down and thinking and coming up with the differential diagnosis, all that stuff, psych, talking to the patients, consoling them, because I'm not going to lie to you. A lot of psych patients have a lot of comorbid, uh, sorry, a lot of skin uh, conditions have comorbid psych conditions. So somebody with uh, eczema or psoriasis or uh, this terrible disease called herdratinitis superativa, HS, uh, which is, which can be debilitating. They end up having anxiety, depression, and everything. So even that aspect of talking to the patients, helping them, um, kind of let them be vulnerable with you. I love that aspect of it too. And I found that dermatology has everything. I can see a kid, I can see newborns. I can see kids. I can see adults. I can see geriatrics. I can actually treat the whole family because let's say the mom comes to you first and she's like, oh, you're a great dermatologist. I want my husband to come. I want my kids to come for their acne. So you treat the whole family. You're the family dermatologist. Um, and it's also very practical. You go out, the skin is out there. So somebody sees you, oh, you're a dermatologist. Can you take a look at this? Can you do this? Can you do that? A lot of things in medicine, it's like, you need to do labs. You need to do that. But the skin is right then and there. I can see it and I can diagnose it. So it's super practical, very useful. And then I love the procedures in dermatology. I don't have to stand in the OR for 10 hours, no scrub-ins or anything. So I like procedures, but not long procedures. And I like the fact that like, you know, if you ask any teenager, who was your best friend, they're going to say the dermatologist because they had acne and the dermatologist gave them their prescription and it helped clear their acne and they loved it. Uh, and so I like taking care of that young population because they become so happy and you increase their quality of life. Unfortunately, middle school and high school, there's a lot of mean people there. There's a lot of bullying. And so somebody with acne or any vitiligo or anything, they're going to get bullied for it. And you're there, you're there as their friend, you're there as their doctor. Um, and you're going to help them feel good about themselves. Like and feel comfortable in their own skin. So I thought that was a very special rewarding thing. And then, and this is more now as a doctor thing, I think as a dermatologist, you're the expert of the skin that you do everything. When the patient comes into your office you look at the lesion. You can either right then and there diagnose it. You know, you whip out your dermatoscope, which is the little magnifying thing. You look at it and you're like, oh, this is cancerous. Let's biopsy this. Or you're like, hey, don't worry about this. This is very benign. We'll just watch it. You don't need anything. Um, but let's say you do biopsy it. I said, I, I mentioned it earlier that a fourth of my dermatology training is going to be in pathology. I have to know how to read uh, slides. Obviously there is a dermatopathology fellowship for one year if I want to further the training, but as a general dermatologist, you should also feel comfortable reading slides too. So I can read my own slides. So I biopsy it. I read my own slide. I diagnose it under the microscope. I bring that patient back and I'm like, Hey, I think we need to treat this uh, surgically. So I'm the surgeon or I'm the proceduralist. I get to take care of it and suture it and tell them to follow up with me or, Hey, this is something uh, like lupus or something take this medication and I give, and I can treat it medically. So I've basically kept everything in house for myself. I didn't have to refer to anybody. I didn't have to send them to anybody. I was the pathologist. I was the doc. I was the basically dermatologist and I was the surgeon or the proceduralist that had to take care of it. Super unique to dermatology um, that you could do everything without having to refer to somebody because you're the expert in that skin. Somebody gets an infection in the skin. I don't have to refer them to an infectious disease specialist. I can take care of it with antibiotics. So I think that's super cool, uh, very unique to it. Then you have cosmetics. I think besides plastics and, and dermatology, cosmetics is unique to our specialties. Um, just, you know, if you are thinking of any cosmetic treatment, don't forget you only have one face. Don't let anybody who's not trained mess it up. You have a lot of cosmetic injectors, nurses, PAs, nurse practitioners, um, even estheticians or whatever. Don't for, training matters. And the training as a dermatologist is four years of med school, four years of residency after undergrad. So if you want to include undergrad, that's 12 years. And some dermatologists do a one-year cosmetic fellowship. So that's 13 years total. You look at plastic surgery. It's a five-year residency and they have a one-year aesthetic fellowship. So for them, it's six years. 
And for them, they do more aesthetic in terms of reconstruction, but they also do injections too and lasers. So if you're thinking of anything, I, you know, just because it's cheaper, trust me, you can have very bad complications. If, if, you know, especially if you get filler around the nose, you want to get that, what we call tinker, uh, Tinkerbell nose, where it goes up, there are blood vessels right there that connect directly to the eye. And if they get injected, you could get blindness. Uh, if you inject any blood vessel with a filler, it can become necrotic. And basically you're going to have a dead skin right there. Um, so that's just on the side. I'm a big advocate of physician led care. Um, go see a physician uh, for your treatment. Um, not, I'm not trying to discredit any of the other specialties, but I think it's also to know that training does matter and you should, you know, the patient deserves the best care and the most, I would say the most educated are the physicians in terms of our training. Yeah. And I think it's great for patients that they can identify a physician that they really trust and then they get to work with them through their entire like dermatology care rather than being bounced back and forth and then trying to figure out. What would you say was the most challenging part of your residency applications? Definitely applying to dermatology. <laughs> I think it was super stressful. Um, you know, as a dermatology applicant, usually, you know, when you're applying to med school, you're competing with everybody. But when you're applying to dermatology, you're applying, you're competing with medical students. So you, they already made it to medical school. So we're, you know, everybody's smart. But within medical school, you have the top, you know, people in the top of their class. And those are tend to be the people who are applying to dermatology. So you're applying against other top applicants to where your applicant, you could be the number one person in your class. Um, when people, when other programs look at it, they have like 500 other people like you. But if you use your application and apply to any other specialty, um, you will be getting interviews at Harvard, Yale, Columbia, all that stuff. So that was very difficult. Like, you know, I, you know, people who apply to dermatology try their hardest, you know, they do the research, they do the board exam, um, they try to become the top of their class. But despite that, you're, you know, you become the cream of the crop in your school. But when you compare you to other derm applicants, you're just one in the dozen. Um, so that was very difficult. It's very humbling, too. It's super humbling. Um, and just reminds you that there's always somebody better, or there's so always somebody more competitive. Um, the most, com uh, obviously, the hardest, I got to say, was just applying, kind of getting through that mental fortitude, like, like there's a chance I might not match to dermatology. Um, and I thought that was very difficult for my end. Uh, always the most difficult for me thing is always the personal statement. It's so hard to write about yourself. And it's so hard, right? To like, when did I really like dermatology? It's always been in the back of my mind. But what was the thing that like, I was like, no, this is what I like to do. And thankfully, I've had a lot of rotations in dermatology before I applied. Uh, I was fortunate that my school allowed us to do electives early on. And I was like, okay, yeah, I definitely know I want to do this. I love the procedures. I love the biopsies. I love freezing stuff. I love doing everything, talking to them. I love doing skin checks. Um, I like the outpatient uh, side. And then you can do inpatient dermatology. I forgot to mention that why dermatology, you could become an in, you can work in the hospital as a full-time inpatient dermatologist, because I'm going to tell you, there are some skin conditions that are very deadly. Um, and so you can, if you, if you love the inpatient setting, you can go work as a, uh, uh, hospitalist dermatologists, like inpatient dermatologists. But the, the most difficult thing about applying to dermatology, if you ask applicants right now, it's finding enough research because everybody wants to do it. It's um, doing well in the classes, doing well in the rotations, doing well in the step two, because you gotta, we do all these things that take years to finish. Because again, you remember med school is four years and it, you have to do all this with a time span of three years. So it's a long game. Like it's, it's a mental fortitude. Like I, I have to do well in this and this and that and you do all that. And when you apply, you end up getting like six or seven interviews, which is I, in med school, it, it, applying to med school. That's great. But applying to residency, usually you want, you know, higher amounts because you're applying, like, I'm going to tell you, I applied to a hundred programs in dermatology and I only got 10 interviews and I have friends who applied to pediatrics only to 26 programs and they had 15 interviews. Just look at the discrepancy. I had a friend who applied, um, 
she applied to 130 dermatology programs. And then she applied to, and she was like, I need to apply to a backup because she was like, I'm not sure I'm going to match. She applied to, I think 20 anesthesiology, just 20 spots out of her 130 um, dermatology programs that she applied to. She only got 10 interviews and out of her 20 um, anesthesia, whatever um, applications she sent out, she had 12 interviews. So Imad, look at that. Like she had less than a 10% yield of interviews for her dermatology. And she had more than 50%. She only applied to 20 anesthesia spots. Um, had the same thing with the girl who applied to internal medicine and dermatology. Um, so it's, it's very difficult. And just a lot of people tell you that your fourth year is super chill because you're applying to residency. Um, it's, it's winding down. But for people who are applying to competitive specialties, actually kind of um, stress inducing because there is a risk of you not matching. And that, that, that's, pretty, that's a pretty tough pill to swallow, honestly, because you work so hard all those years and some people just like, uh, slip through the crack. Are the applications relatively similar, like filling yeah. out 100? Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, you do a personal statement, you get rec letters. Uh, so it's, it's, it's fairly similar to what the MCAS was. Very highly recommend as soon as you start med school, day one, open a notes tab if you have an iPhone or a computer or whatever. Everything that you do, research, volunteering, anything that you do, uh, extra level, uh, you know, leadership, extracurricular activities, write it down. Because once you apply to residency, you will have a full list. That's what I did. Day one of med school, I started a notes tab. And three years later, I still had that notes tab and it was updated so many freaking time. And by the time I applied to residency, I was like, oh, I don't, I don't have to sit and I'm like, what did I do? What did I do? I had a whole list of what I did, research, um, leadership experiences, um, volunteering, anything that I needed to be in my application, had it already done because I kept track of it uh, during um, those three years. That was a great suggestion. I will definitely <laughs> be using that. Um, so you mentioned the step exams. Do you have any like tips or resources for people on how to do well? Yeah, so step one is pass fail. Um, I highly recommend the three main common resources and I can type them down. Uh, Pathoma, I mentioned it for pathology. It's amazing. Then you have Sketchy for pharmacology and uh, microbiology. Those are really good. And then let's see, there's also boards and beyond. I don't know. Can y'all see the chat? Boards and mm -hmm. beyond. Boards and beyond is like everything else. Those three. Um, and then you have like the first aid book. First aid book is more of a reference when you're studying for step one. Uh, I still have my first aid book. I reference it here and there, um, but it covers everything that's in step one. It has everything listed. Obviously, if you look at it, you're like, oh my God, that's so much. Um, but those are like the biggest four that you would use. There's like new ones that are coming out, like Pixarize for biochem and immunology. I heard was good. Oh, I know y'all heard about this, but I'm a big, big Anki person. Anki is great. Like the, the, the consistency, the, the key to medicine is uh, retention and repetitive. Uh, the, uh, God, there's a word for it, but the way they just keep giving you those cards, like comes back three days later, five days later, then comes back after a week. It just redundant and it switches it from short-term memory to long-term memory. Anki is very big. Yes, and there's a lot of people using that right now for MCAT prep. <laughs> Yeah, the miles down deck. I definitely recommend when um, when people sign up and I basically give because I usually I usually do individual advising and I help them create a like a map. And so when they ask me about what to study for the MCAT, I'm like, look, I don't really tutor for the MCAT, but when you make your schedule, definitely do the miles down deck. Like watch a video, do the cards associated with it. I think it definitely helps a lot. I wish I had the miles down deck um, when I was studying for the MCAT. So we just have two more questions. Um, the first one is, do you have any specific advice for aspiring dermatologists? Um, is this for med students or pre-meds? So this is pre-meds, people that are going into medical school, hoping okay. to eventually. So aspiring dermatologists, I would say always keep you know, keep an open mind. It's good that you think, you know, you, you, you think, I'm not going to say, you know, that you want to do dermatology. A lot of us think we know, 
but it's good that you, uh, that you're interested in dermatology, keep that passion with you hundred percent. Um, big advice as a pre-med right now, the, the most you could do is shadow a dermatologist, shadow a dermatologist, work as an MA, work as a scribe for a dermatology office, uh, some, somehow get into a dermatology office and see what they do in their day-to-day life. If you really enjoy it, if you love it, like get, get yourself uh, some exposure to it. I wish I did. Um, but let's say you go into med school again, keep an open mind, um, and check out other fields because there are other fields that go hand in hand with dermatology, like rheumatology, allergy, immunology, those fields are under internal medicine. They go hand in hand, maybe plastic surgery. Uh, you like plastic surgery, but in med school, definitely get connected with mentors. And if you are going to med school, um, I would aim for a med school that's affiliated uh, with a hospital that has a dermatology residency. Having a home program uh, will always put you at an advantage uh, versus people who don't have a home program. There are med schools, typically the O schools, don't have a home. Uh, they have affiliations with a hospital, but that hospital doesn't have a dermatology program. So they don't have a home derm program. Um, but that always uh, is uh, helpful. So thankfully I did have a home derm program, uh, which is where I'm going actually, because um, I got interviews at other places, but I preferred to stay in Texas. And I loved my program. There are such great people. I think I'm going to get great training over there. So um, that's why I ranked them my number one uh, program and lucky enough to match there. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> um, so is there anything you think you did while in medical school that helped set your application apart? Yes, I think let's look at things subjectively because objectively, everybody, most people, I would say 80% of applicants in dermatology are all going to have the objective measures, the good step scores, um, the good, you know, no, we don't look at GPA, but uh, top of the class, they do ranking basically where are you ranked uh, at your class. So they're going to be top quartile, good step score. Look at things subjectively. I think what set me apart is my personal statement. I I've had a lot of compliments about my personal statement, like, uh, and not just, uh, not just from dermatology, because I have to apply to dermatology, but then right now I'm doing my intern. Year. I had to apply to those programs separately. So people in my intern year programs that I applied to all loved my personal statement, even though they knew I was going to do dermatology because I, you only apply to one year because they know they're going to, you're going to go somewhere else to dermatology next year. Everybody complimented my personal. Statement, and I feel like, uh, I had a, you know, I knew somebody who was an English teacher and I told her like what needed to be in there. And she was very brutal when she um, kind of criticized it. And then I also sent it to a dermatologist and she was also like a writer and a reader. So she like decimated it. So um, I feel like that helped set my personal statement apart. Um, as far as outside my personal statement, I did some volunteering in undergrad that I've continued in med school and certain organizations like Palestine Children Relief Fund. I'm from Palestine. So I worked with this organization for six years and I've continued it. Um, and uh, other project downtown uh, is also local through DFW that I did in undergrad and I did in med school. So having these two to three organizations that I actually continued in med school helped set me apart too, because they saw how passionate I was about community service. Nothing was medical related. Nothing was germ related that I did volunteering. This was something I was just passionate about. This is just a human a humanitarian cause that I was like, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. And it kind of shined through my application. Cause sometimes they'd ask me, they're like, and they'll see that I worked through this. Like, you know how, when you apply to med school, they're like, don't put anything that you did in high school. It's only what you did in undergrad. It's kind of a similar thing uh, when you apply to residency. We don't care about what you did in undergrad, do what you did in med school, except if it was a research project or if it's anything humanitarian that like you started in undergrad and you've actually continued in med school. You're not going to say you continue, uh, you did this in med school. You say you continued it in med school. So it showed in my application that I did this for like six years prior to uh, you know applying to residency. And just how I spoke about it when they you know, ask me a question about it. Um, I think that set me apart completely because I've got, uh, I got a lot of good feedback, like literally in the interview, they've given me feedback about my answers and just about, uh, about my experiences. They, they really thought it was what set me apart is 
that everybody was so focused on academics. And be, because I've had all the academics, I checked those boxes out. I still did what I really like to do on the side, which is humanitarian causes, kind of helping my people out overseas. Um, so I feel like that subjective stuff of volunteering helps set me apart. And I checked the box with research. Like, this is just subjective things that can help set you apart. Some people love mentoring. And so they'll, they'll go, um, you know, they'll teach English to, you know, immigrants and refugees. Some people do other things. It doesn't have to be medically related. It just has to be something meaningful to where you can speak about it or write about it to where your, your passion shines through and you can talk about it during your interview as well. I think that's important to keep in mind things like this. It's not about checking boxes. It's about actually finding something that you are genuinely devoted to. Yeah. So our last question is just how do you manage your work-life balance? Oh man, that's a good question. I feel like I'm a workaholic, honestly. Um, I, I think, you know, I'm thankful for my wife. She's, she helps ground me. Um, because I remember in med school, you know, I got married at the last year end of med school. Um, in med school, I, my, my roommate, my then roommate could attest that I was just studying all the time, doing all this all the time. And he would always force me like, let's go out, let's do this. Um, but right now she kind of help has plans for us. So she, she helps me be spontaneous. Like, Hey, let's go eat out. Let's go picnic. Let's go walk. Let's go ride bikes, all that stuff. So let's go for brunch. I don't like brunch, but she likes it. I like brunch now. Um, so I feel like she grounds me. I, when I come home, I definitely want to turn off anything that's work related and just want to focus on my personal life. Um, so she's helped me a lot with managing it, but not a lot of people, you know, residency is busy as, uh, already as it is. And I just, you know, the whole, uh, med school advising and consulting, you know, I work for med school insiders, you know, the Kevin Jabal thing, but then I also started my own thing on the side. So I have these two side jobs plus my residency that I work almost 70 hours a week. Um, not because I'm trying to burn myself out. It's just something I'm passionate about. I love talking to pre-meds. I love mentoring. I love advising. Like I love doing that, but it is still technically work. Um, and so I find my balance uh, kind of with my wife, with my personal life, and friends and family. So uh, I, I love hanging out with them, going out. I'm not a restaurant type of person. I just like getting together and just sitting down, chilling and talking. That's I'm that type of vibe type of person and like playing a lot of volleyball. Uh, so I, I do that a lot. That's how I kind of balance my work life balance. But I also don't like not to do anything because I have to always do something, which is why I said I consider myself a workaholic. I always have to do something because if I sit and I'm bored, I'm just too bored. Um, so uh, that's a very bad answer. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, thank you so much for giving us your time um, this weekend. This has been a really great session. You've learned a lot about dermatology and about your journey and your career. Um, I invite everyone to give a big thank you in the chat. <laughs> Thank you. I'm more than happy to come back, you know, in a couple of months. I really, I, f I felt like I mentioned a lot of things that I wish I covered in an earlier one. I want to go through basic dermatology terms. So that way, if y'all ever decide to shadow a dermatologist or y'all are going to start med school, y'all are going to learn this again. Um, I'd be more than happy to kind of create this um, super basic intro to dermatology, kind of describing lesions and stuff like that. This was more I put intro to basic dermatology for med students, but I assume for pre-meds, not a lot of you have heard of these uh, conditions. So it's probably a little too advanced. So I do apologize for that. If it kind of went over y'all's head. And we always love to hear about crazy medical stuff. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm happy to thank y'all for y'all's attention. And, um, you know, if you need to reach out to me, please, uh, I, can I put my Instagram on the chat? I don't know if that's possible or anything. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. So it's just Mujahid Shalabi. This is my first name, last name. And uh, you can DM me. Um, I know application cycles uh, coming up in like two months. So if you need any professional, personal one-on-one -on -one help, hit me up. More than happy to help you. All right, everybody. Y'all have a good weekend. Thank yeah. you so much. Now we're going to conduct our session views and dates. The link to the quiz for this session is now live. 
you'll need a 70% or higher to pass and receive certification. And the link to the quiz is being sent in the chat now. For our next session dates, which will also be posted throughout our social media outlets, so be sure to follow us at Teleshadowing. Our next live session will be Saturday, March 18th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with a physician mentoring us in internal medicine. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending today's session, and we hope to see you in upcoming sessions as well. Thank you for attending today's shadowing.